one second. Because if, if I don't do this now, I'm going to forget. Um, no, you, you can sit. <laughs> Somebody told me before service that uh, we have someone in the congregation celebrating a birthday today. Now, I can't say what age. It's not appropriate to mention a lady's age, but I'm told it's a big one. So uh, anyway, Val, I understand it's your birthday today. Tomorrow, close enough. Can we sing her happy birthday? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Val. Happy birthday to you. All right, so uh, Brian is on vacation, so I'm your substitute. And if you remember the days when you were a student, when you were younger, and maybe it's the same today, sometimes the substitute teacher would come in and they would attempt to teach from the curriculum that the teacher had been following. Then you had these other substitutes who would come in and just purely do their own thing. Today, I'm doing my own thing, not following Brian's curriculum. So he's been speaking on the Old Testament, uh, and I'm not going to do that today, but I do promise that I will make at least one or two references to the Old Testament. But um, I, just, I want you to do something with me. I want to put Brian to the test. So whatever you do, don't tell Brian that I didn't follow his curriculum. And then we'll see if he actually watches services when he's away. So if he says something to me, I'll know he watched, and if he didn't, then if he doesn't, then I know he didn't. So deal? Deal? Amen? And by the way, I'm sure most of you know what the word amen means, but maybe there's somebody here who doesn't. It's an affirming statement of what we've just said. It actually translates to mean, so be it. So we're not going to tell Brian. So be it? Amen? All right. All right, so with Easter only four weeks away, four weeks away I can't help but think about and want to talk about the wonder of what happened over those three days. So we're going to get right into it. Now, don't challenge my math, but just uh, take this for the message I'm trying to convey. 1,993 years and 334 days ago, the cross symbolized punishment. The cross symbolized pain. The cross symbolized fear. The cross symbolized Roman power and dominion. It was a tool used by the Romans to end the lives of criminals and opponents of Caesar and Roman rule. And they used crucifixion because it was the most painful and humiliating ways to end someone's life. Then the meaning of the cross changed. 1,993 years and 332 days ago, the cross symbolized love. The cross symbolized sacrifice. The cross symbolized redemption. And it symbolized Jesus' power and dominion. And although the Romans would use the cross for years to come, over time the cross took on a new meaning. When Jesus was sacrificed, People thought the cross was the end, when in fact, it was the beginning. One day, the world changed. One day, something was unleashed in this world, and it would never be the same. In the book, Who is This Man? by John Ortberg, he makes a point that as far as we know, in the last 2,000 years, there is only one day when literally not one person in the world believed Jesus was alive. And that day was Saturday. Friday and Sunday are probably the two most studied, talked about, preached on, and discussed days in all of human history. But no one talks about Saturday. The Bible doesn't even make much reference to Saturday. It's the day after the day before. Ortberg calls it an in-between day. It's in between despair and joy. It's in between confusion and clarity. 
between bad news and good news, in between darkness and light, and in between death and life. It's a day nothing happens. The disciples had their dreams of how they were going to change the world. And in their minds, that all came crashing down on Friday. And then it was Saturday. What did they talk about? Maybe they asked, how could this have gone so wrong? Jesus failed. He couldn't win. He couldn't convince enough people to follow him. He couldn't even convince his own disciples to stand up for him. Everybody knows a Saturday. You wake up and your dream has died. You have to go on, but you don't know how and you don't know why. So why is there even a Saturday in the crucifixion and resurrection story? It's a nothing day. Nothing happens. Why wait? Why was Jesus not resurrected on Saturday? Why is Saturday relevant? Or is it even relevant? You know, what I've come to know is that everything, everything in the Bible has relevance. No matter how insignificant it may seem, Even though we may gloss over many of the details, everything in the Bible has purpose. And even though Saturday seemed like a nothing day, I guarantee you it wasn't. So first of all, God loves three-day stories. And all of these stories share the same structure. On the first day, there's trouble. On the third day, there's deliverance. The second day is just a continuation of trouble. The problem with the three-day story is that on the second day, you don't know that there's a third day. You may think the second day will never end. And if you're a Leafs fan, it's always Saturday. (laughs) Sunday never comes. So when Abraham, okay, here's the Old Testament reference. When Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, he sees the sacrifice that would save his son, on the third day. Joseph's brothers were put in jail in Egypt and they were released on the third day. When the Israelites left Egypt, they traveled into the desert and found water. When? On the third day. This is the interactive part where I make sure you're awake. When Rahab hid the spies from their enemies, they were told they would be safe when? On the third day. Esther and her people fasted for their safety, and the king receives her favorably when? On the third day. When Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the Lord commanded, and the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land on the third day. By the way, you know what Jonah's prayer was the whole time he was in the belly of the fish? Lord, let me go out the same way I came in. So, so Saturday was quiet. <clears throat> Saturday was a nothing day. Saturday was a day when God was silent. Have you ever had those days? Have you ever had those weeks? Maybe those months or even those years? When you were praying for something, waiting for something, and it didn't come, or maybe it still hasn't come. We know the resurrection story. We know what happened on Sunday when the world changed. On Saturday, the disciples did not know what would happen on Sunday. They were lost. Their hopes were crushed. Their dreams were shattered. And there was silence. Silence happens on Saturday. After trouble hits you, after the agony of Friday, you call out to God, hear me, listen to me, respond to me, say something, do something. Nothing. In addition to the pain of Friday, there's the pain of silence and the absence of God. Even the angels may have looked down and said, what happened? Our God lies dead. We've all lived in a Saturday, and some choose to stay in Saturday, while others choose to hope for Sunday. And it's not easy when you're in a state of loss, a state of agony, despair, or a state of fear. And Saturdays can be filled with anxiety. Anxiety, as we know, is a problem in today's society, and it seems to be a growing problem. It, it cripples people. 
you know, why is, why is anxiety such a problem? You know, lots of theories. Social media gets implicated often. You know, everyone gets stressed over comparing their life to what they see on social media, all the glamour. But remember, you know, what you see on your friend's Facebook page is what they want you to see. You say, if you want to see the real truth, go see your friend's friend's Facebook page and see the real pictures. And then just even the population growth. When I was born, 1969, the population was 3.6 billion people. A child being born today is being born into a world of 8.1 billion people. It's more than doubled in my lifetimes. So you think you just, that intensifies, anxiety intensifies as we grow. So let's talk about anxiety. It fits between worry and fear. Worry is thinking about a problem or thinking about fears. Anxiety is the anticipation of a threat or fear. And fear is an emotional response to a real or perceived threat. So fear is actually healthy. It protects us and keeps us from harm. So when you hear a loud noise like a gunshot or an explosion, something falling, something, you know, somebody come wielding an ax at you, fear is the correct response. But when fear strikes, your rational thoughts are taken over by a part of your brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala plays a critical role in controlling our emotions, especially fear and anxiety. So it helps detect potential threats and dangers and triggers our body's fight or flight response. So when your amygdala takes over, it's called an amygdala hijack because our rational brain takes a back seat to the amygdala. And when your body responds, the blood rushes to your big muscles like your legs so that you can use that power to either run or fight. And that's why your heart rate increases, your breathing speeds up, you tremble, you get sweaty palms. And sometimes anxiety can be so much that you feel the same... um, effects in your body as you would when you have fear. You know, you've heard it said that do not be afraid is the most frequent command in the Bible. Well, in the context in which it's used, I believe it's referring to anxiety. And the Apostle Paul summed it up nicely in his letter to the Philippians when he wrote, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if we trust God, we do not need to be concerned about anxiety. And if we trust God is in control, then we don't have to worry about anxiety. But to not be anxious, as we all know, is easier said than done. When you're in a constant state of anxiety like the apostles would have been on Saturday, it's difficult to focus on anything else. It can be all-consuming. But that's why God does not want us to be anxious. Because when we're anxious, we can't focus on what he wants us to focus on, and we cannot be our best selves. So I woke up early this morning, and I'm lying in bed thinking about the message today, and then this thought creeps into my mind but something I said to somebody at work. And I start to run through the consequences if they took it the wrong way, uh, how they would react, would somebody else hear about it, could I get in trouble over it? So I just went into this spiral, and I started to feel anxious about my thoughts, and I realized exactly what was happening. I was being distracted from what I was supposed to be focused on today. So I've recently asked some of you a question And that question is, when are you at your best? When are you most alive, most connected with what God wants you to do? When are all the cells in your body lit up and you're firing on all cylinders? Well, for me, it's when I'm serving. Whether it's here on Sunday morning at the doors or being up here this morning, that's when I feel like I'm at my best, but I can't be distracted by anxiety. In 1 John, the Apostle John tells us that perfect love casts out fear. 
says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So Steve Cuss is an author of Managing Leadership Anxiety, and he points out that perfect love casts out fear, it casts out anxiety. And he says, anxiety or fear do not cast out perfect love, but he does say it interrupts it. It detracts from it. It short-circuits it. So when we're in a state of anxiety, we're incapable of loving fully. We're incapable of serving fully because we're distracted by our anxiety. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. It's not a recommendation. It's a command. Do not be anxious. Now, I don't think it's a command like the Ten Commandments that thou shalt not be anxious. I don't think anxiety is a choice. It's not easy, but the command comes with the solution. Prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. The definition of petition is to make or present a formal request to an authority, and that authority being God. So today, a reminder that when you're dealing with anxiety or a particular situation, bring that to God. Bring it to the king who has promised to guard your hearts and minds from anxiety. So be it. Amen. Okay, so let's get back to Saturday. A mom, a dad, find out their child has a terminal illness. They pray like they've never prayed before, but hear only silence. She's getting worse. You lose a job. You lose a friend. You have a dream for your child, but that dream dies on Friday. What do you do on Saturday? You can choose despair. Some say there will not be a Sunday. It's Saturday. Get used to it. They do disappointment management because this is as good as it's going to get. Some people secretly, silently live here. Or there's another option. You can wait. Work with God. Even when he feels far away, pray, ask, whine, complain, trust. The most common psalm is the psalm of complaint. Why aren't you listening? The Apostles' Creed does not appear anywhere in scripture. It was not written by the apostles. It was written by the early church in an effort to express and summarize the faith given by Christ to the apostles. And it's the oldest creed in the Christian church. The apostles' creed speaks of this day, Saturday. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried Friday. He descended to hell Saturday. The third day, Sunday, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Is it possible that Jesus descended into hell? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, John testifies of his encounter with Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. So Jesus is the key holder. When you're the key holder, you can go through every door. He has absolute control over every domain. So could he have descended into hell? You bet he could have, because he's in control. So my second last point, I want to share a paragraph from the book that I find extremely provocative by John Ortberg. So I'm going to read it. There's a great silence on Saturday because the king sleeps. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent as for a lost sheep. 
The Apostles' Creed says Jesus descended into hell. Somehow, no suffering you go through is suffering Jesus will not endure in order to save you. From a human standpoint, we think of the miraculous day as Sunday, the day the man Jesus has risen from the dead. I wonder if from heaven's standpoint, the great miracle isn't on Saturday. When Jesus is born, the skies are filled with the heavenly host, praising God because that baby is Emmanuel, God with us. Somehow, God in a manger. Somehow, God in a stable. Somehow, God on earth. Now on Saturday, the angels look down and see what? God in a tomb? The miracle of Sunday is that a dead man lives. The miracle of Saturday is that the eternal Son of God lies dead. So Jesus Christ defeats our great enemy death, not by proclaiming his invincibility over it, but by submitting himself to it. If you can find this Jesus in a grave, if you can find him in death, if you can find him in hell, where can you not find him? Where will he not turn up? You know, I'd not really taken note of the subtitle of the book, Who Is This Man? The subtitle is The Unpredictable Impact of the Inescapable Jesus. Inescapable. Where will he not turn up? Well, the answer is nowhere. There is nowhere he will not go for you. It is unimaginable what he will do for you. You know, I love the words in Corey Asbury's song, Reckless Love. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down coming after me. So fear not. Do not be anxious, for I am with you. I am inescapable, and I promise to be with you to the very end of the age. The apostles didn't know it, but he was there on Saturday. So when I'm done up here in a moment, Kristen will come and lead us in the remembrance of what Christ did for us. And in exactly four weeks from now, we'll hear about and celebrate the great miracle of Sunday. The pain and anxiety of Saturday will be over. And we'll be reminded that this is a three-day story, not a two-day story. We'll be reminded that the cross took on a different meaning for what it was originally intended. We'll be reminded that over these three days, the world changed. We'll be reminded that the three-day story is the lead story of all stories in the history of the world. We'll be reminded that even though there are Fridays and there are Saturdays, There are Sundays, and Sunday is coming. Thank you. So if, and most likely when, you're confronted by anxiety this week, remember, God has given us the solution. Prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. When Jesus was crucified, all of the principalities of darkness thought they had won, when in fact, they just opened a door to a greater love and understanding the world had never known. So when you're faced with anxiety, it may just be an opportunity for an open door to become more reliant on Christ. So let me pray for you before you go. God, we are thankful for the depth of your love. We are thankful for you always, for your promise to always be with us. And we are thankful that we are yours. So Father, I pray this week for your hand of protection over your people as we go into the world. So be it. Amen.